Welcome to Regional Arts Australia's Artlands Conversation Series. My name is Scott Howie, and I am the General Manager at Regional Arts Australia. And I'm joining you today from Wagga Wagga on the lands of the mighty Wiradjuri Nation. Regional Arts Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the land throughout Australia, and we pay our respects to elders past and present. I'm delighted to welcome you to the eighth session of the Artlands Conversation Series, Field Guiding the Erratic, with a published event. All of the Artlands programming is supported by the Australian Government's Regional Arts Funds. I'll take a short moment to acknowledge that a lot of the country is in lockdown right now, and Regional Arts Australia's thoughts go out to all the artists and communities that are currently affected. RAA hopes everyone can stay safe as we collectively continue to navigate the ongoing challenges of COVID regionally, nationally, and internationally. We'll start with just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Today's session will be Auslan interpreted and closed captioning is available. If you wish to enlarge the view of the Auslan interpreters, scroll over the top right hand corner of their video panel, and there is a drop down menu where you can select pin video. This will make the presenter screen larger. There are two Auslan interpreters today, Shavoy and Catherine, welcome. They will interpret for about 15 minutes each and then swap over. So you'll need to pin each interpreter to maintain the larger screen size. Down the bottom of the, your screen, scroll over, you'll see a chat icon and a Q and A icon. Please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. During the session, um, use the Q&A to ask questions um, to the panelists for our Q question and answer session at the end of the talk. We'll have some time at the end to explore those questions, but we apologize if we don't get to yours. As I mentioned before, today's topic is field guiding the erratic, and we are hearing from the artist duo, a published event. Justy Phillips and Margaret Woodward, who make long-term relational artworks through shared acts of public telling. They explore chance encounter constructed situations and the shared authorship of lived experience. They work with language, ideas and publishing. Today's conversation, we'll see Justy and Margaret discuss how during their 2019 tenure as Ruth Stephen Fellows at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University, they began to deliver a new field of creative inquiry around the concept of the erratic. So please welcome to your screens, Justy and Margaret. <clears throat> Thank you, Scott. Can everybody see and hear okay? Right. Okay, I would like to begin by acknowledging the true custodians of the land in which we live and work. We are here in Lutruwita, Tasmania, on Palawa land, specifically on the land of the Muanina people, and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. And I would also like to acknowledge this, that this land was never ceded. We're situated just south of Nipaluna, Hobart, on the banks of the Tintamili Minanya, the Duant River. I'd like to thank Regional Arts for inviting us to participate in these Artlands conversations and also send heartfelt thoughts to those of you who, who are in lockdown who are joining us today. I'd also like to welcome and say hello to friends who I know are joining us and to friends who will be listening to this as the recording later on because they're in unsympathetic time zones, to Nancy Cool, Jen Bourbon, Erica Van Horn, Ted Hendrickson, who were our collaborators on this project, and also to say hello to Barbara Bosworth, who I know is joining us from Connecticut live. Uh, okay, so for, for the way we're going to structure today's session is I'm going to speak first of all about some of the background to our project, Erratic Ecologies, and some of our time spent in researching it. And then I'll pass over to Justy and she's going to talk about some of um, the the conceptual aspects and the production aspects of this, of this work. So as Scott mentioned, we work with language ideas and publishing to make long-term relational artworks through the shared acts of public telling. We use chance encounters, constructed situations and the shared authorship of lived experience. 
through publishing as art practice to co-compose complex fields of social, cultural and political relationship, relations. And at this point, I'll just share my screen and get the... We place a high value on collaboration and over the last six years have developed long-term relationships with many Australian and international artists and writers through artworks that include The Fall of the Derwent, which was a hydrographic score that we composed on the banks of the River Derwent here, commissioned for Glenorchy Art and Sculpture Park. It's a downloadable score that can be downloaded from our website. Lost Rocks 2017 to 21, which is a slow publishing artwork of 43 fictionellas by 45 artists over five years. And that project is coming to an end. Actually, this week as we speak, we've had um, the last five, six books in this series um, delivered to us here and we're about to distribute um, to our subscribers around the world. And finally, the People's Library 2018, which was a performance library of 113 books by 150 Tasmanian writers hosted by the Salamanca Arts Centre in collaboration with many authors and including readers in residence. And I know that we have two of our readers in residence um, online, Catherine Bird and Ross Gibson. You can see more of our projects and, and in fact a lot more about um, the project that we're talking about today on our website and just you all post into the chat links to um, the website and other websites that we're going to mention today. Today's conversation, Field Guiding the Erratic, focuses on work that flowed from an intense period of field work and research undertaken in America in 2019 during which time we were with Stephen Fellows at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. We were intrigued and delighted to find that Ruth Stephan, who, whose named fellowship we had, was a writer and publisher who through the radical and experimental publication Tiger's Eye, the magazine she established with her, her husband, artist John Stephan in the 1950s. She nurtured emerging artists, writers and poets alongside established practitioners. Uh, that previous slide was the outside of the Beinecke Library at Yale University, an extraordinary um, uh, piece of architecture by Gordon Bunshaft. And this is the inside of the Beinecke, which again is, is just an awe-inspiring place to visit or indeed spend a, a month there as we were lucky to. And you can see that central stack of books there, which is just part of the holdings of many millions of objects, manuscripts um, and, and rare books. And those windows there, this is a close-up of the windows, are slices of marble that let the light through. So because we had already this interest in geology, uh, when we arrived there, we were in, uh, I think for a month, some kind of um, heaven. Uh, and we also want to extend our thanks to the staff at the Beinecke for welcoming, welcoming us so warmly um, over that period of time. And in particular to curators, Nancy Cool and Tim Young, who we worked closely with while we were there. So when we applied for the fellowship at the Beinecke, we needed to identify a particular collection to focus on in the, the vast um, holdings of the library, which is one of the largest and most dynamic collections of rare books and manuscripts in the world. So our proposal focused on the concept of the erratic, inspired originally through the geologic definition of the erratic as a glacially transported boulder so those rocks that were carried by a glacier had deposited some distance away from their bedrock. When the glacier receded, those rocks are dropped. Sometimes they're carried, uh, you know, many kilometers, in some instances, hundreds of kilometers um, from their original resting place. 
So much of Tasmania's, oh, so that's the, the reading room in the Beinecke Library. Much of Tasmania's west and highlands has been formed by glacial action. And so glacial, uh, sorry, um, erratics here are a familiar part of our landscape. And this, this is, this image here is of me next to a glacial erratic on the west coast, just north of Queenstown in an area called the Henty Erratic Field. Um, and it has a plaque on it. This is called the Grooved Erratic. Um, so it's, um, I guess these are, these are significant features in the landscape. You, you, you don't miss them. And little did we know that when we uh, made this application to the Beinecke, that that area that um, Yale University is located in, in Connecticut, is also the heartland of extensive uh, glacial erratic boulder fields. And with many of the individual boulders having their own names. So this one here is called Balanced Rock. Um, and they really have become significant landmarks for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. This one gives you an idea here of the scale of these um, boulders. Some of them are, you know, as big as, as houses. Um, and as part of the research before we went to America, we found this wonderful map, although it's a little hard to see the detail, which is a list of all the named erratics around America. Um, and it, so the ones that we've just looked at, um, the balanced rock, for instance, is named on that list there. So these became key tools for us in starting the research before we, we even got to the Beinecke. This is another one called Parking Lot Erratic, which is also in Connecticut. So why erratic? Um, erratics were first named by the Swiss German geologist and glaciologist Jean de Charpentier who hypothesized that these boulders that he'd observed in the Swiss Alps and in the Jura Mountains were brought there by glaciers that no longer existed. Um, so our, our fascination with, with erratics really arose from us undertaking that large project Lost Rocks and thinking geologically as we were. And one day we had one of those conversations where we said to each other, if you were to be a rock or if you were to, you know, it's like, what, what animal would you, would you be? Uh, we said to each other, what rock would you be? And my first instinct was to say, uh, I feel like I'm an erratic. And digging more deeply into that, it was because I had this sense of being out of place in some way. Um, Justy is a migrant to Luchuita, Tasmania from the north of England and my family seven years earlier are Irish and Eng English settlers and convicts. So in different ways, we are both post-colonial residents in Lutruwita, in, in which colonialism still um, has an impact on Indigenous life. And we recognise that we ourselves are erratics in this place. And we occupy this deeply con complex and contested um, existence uh, in unceded Aboriginal land. So we started to think beyond this idea of the geological definition of erratic. Then, uh, as I mentioned, applying to the Beinecke, we had to identify and isolate a particular collection uh, of work that we wanted to, to investigate while we were there. So curious about this concept of the erratic and what that potential that might hold for us, we were drawn to the work of Erica Van Horn an American writer, artist and publisher who now lives in Tipperary in Ireland with Simon Cutts, where their long-standing artist publishing venture of Coracle Press is located. So we started to think about Erica as an erratic, somebody who, who's from America, but residing in Ireland. The Beinecke Library has an extensive collection of Erica's work from the 1980s through to the present including her artist books, her journals, and many of Coracle's publications of artists' other work. So a, a really wonderful and extensive collection. These next few slides show some of Erica's work and we were you know, intrigued um, 
by this concept, as I said, of Erica being in Ireland. And, and I think these two little postcards um, highlight that, you know, this idea of a blow in somebody from somewhere else, uh, of being abroad. And this sort of started this process through our research for us to accumulate and collect words that that um, clustered around this notion of the erratic in a way to expand it. Mostly we were drawn to Erica's quotidian observations of small matters. Um, she has a, a wonderful practice of acutely attending to a part rather than to the whole broad sweep. If you want to follow up Erica's work, uh, she's got a wonderful book called Living Locally, published by Uniform Books, in which she details uh, many aspects of living in, in, in Ireland, uh, things to do with the weather, people she meets, uh, walks, her, her dog, uh, funny signs, language, you know, different differences in language between Ireland and, and America. Erica says about her work um, and about the, the Living Locally book, she says from its beginning in 2000, and, oh, so, sorry, the Living Locally book is based on her blog that she uh, publishes online. Um, and so the, the, the book is a kind of a comp compilation of extracts from the blog in which she says from its beginning in 2007, the exercise has been to describe my life in rural Ireland. I do not make any claims that this life is the life of anyone else here. I simply note the things that I observe and learn in a quiet place where perhaps not, perhaps not very much happens. I will always be an outsider looking in, but I like to think that just by sticking around, I am at least local enough. So Erica's in, intrigued um, by, by the local and, and by the vernacular that accumulates around local acts. So this is a, 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 a postcard or a card that lists the names of Irish potatoes. And uh, Erica and I have, have had great uh, correspondence communicating about um, being in, uh, living in Lutruwita, Tasmania, where we are very fond of our potatoes and they're all named. We've had lots of communication comparing notes on names for potatoes. But we were also looking at, uh, we used Erica's collection as a starting point, but of course um, we strayed and wandered like true, true erratics and went off piste and looked at uh, many other works in the library. So while the word erratic has over the years acquired pejorative associations, think about you know, descriptions of erratic behavior and erratic weather and erratic health. The original word, sorry, the original meaning of the word erratic comes from the Latin word errare, to wander or stray, a movement known as wandering, eccentric and queer, and a metaphysical condition which we are referring to as erraticness. Erraticness gives one permission to wander and we carried this a deliberate awareness, this out of placeness to the study of Erica's work in the Beinecke. And so while undertaking this close scrutiny of Erica's work in the Beinecke Library, we were also curious to trace this wandering nature of the word erratic. And in the process, we compiled an expanded vocabulary that incorporated the more than limited uses of the, the word erratic that we've become accustomed to with its unpredictable and, and irrational side foremost. So instead of thinking of it as a negative term, we started to gather this list of words. And this list was drawn from uh, sometimes from um, books that we were looking at or artworks or um, from, in, from a wonderful um, vocabulary around glaciology as well, which has its own, own sort of poetry associated with it. So today we would like to move you through just one striation of our research, a movement that has led us to the production of the Erratic Ecologies Field Station that Justy will talk more about in the second part of this talk. 
surging from the erratic stars of Chaucer's 16th century poem, Troilus and Cressida, through the erratic motion of the planets in Copernican astronomy, to Charpentier's terrain erratic of the Jura Mountains and Mark Dion's fragments of travel, exploration and, our, and adventure. Our route was also fed by the words of contemporary writers and poets, Erica Van Horn and Simon Cutts, as well as Susan Howe, Jen Bourbon, Nancy Cool, and Richard Deming. Through each of these artists, we've charted a path from one critical research source to another, like stepping stones, accessing key works by poet William Carlos Williams, Ian Hamilton, Finlay and Mary Rufel, and combining an erratic vocabulary as we go. As we're interested in this process of what we call languaging, um, this this accumulating vocabulary to speak about erratics, as I said before, sometimes came from, um, from, the, from language and literature, but at other times came from the language of, of glaciology and geology. So words such as surge and quiesce and ablation uh, and terms such as glacial tongue and glacial milk and chatter marks, these are all part of this accumulating language. And we were also struck by how this language of erraticness seems now, looking back uh, two years later, this language now seems to have kind of infiltrated our, our language, our vernacular of unpredictability. When we hear about surges in coronavirus, coronavirus cases or corona variants, or we speak of uncertain and strange times. We were, we were intrigued to know that um, the first instance of the first published instance of the word erratic, you can see there where my finger is, um, appeared in Chaucer, uh, in Troilus and Cressida. And um, one of the amazing things about being in the Beinecke was all these references that we were accessing even before we got there, the Beinecke actually holds the, uh, you know, holds the actual books, the original sources. So. Um, this book is from 1541, and there we could find um, the word erratic first mentioned there in relation to the stars taking an erratic course instead of them in, of thinking of them at the time as being fixed. We're also interested in instances of errata. So again, it comes from that Latin stem to err or to wander or to you know be somehow in error or mistake. So part of our work was undertaken inside the Beinecke Library and another part of the work was undertaken in the field and field work is a big part of our practice. So thinking differently about erraticness, we recognise that field work, our field work which is an, always an important component of our practice is a process of erratic wandering that has unfolded in libraries, archives, residencies, or at large in the landscape. This kind of fieldwork or fictioneering in itself is an erratic activity, a deliberate and intentional strategy to shift context, build new relations, and attend to a material awareness of place. It allows one to be both in and out of place at the same time. We were fortunate to undertake a number of field trips whilst in Connecticut, guided by friends and colleagues that we met at the Beinecke and while we were visiting artists at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation. The terrain of Connecticut and Massachusetts has been shaped by the advance and the retreat of the Wisconsin glacial episode, whose ice sheet covered much of North America in the period which began some 150,000 years ago and ending around 50,000 years ago, leaving in its path a landscape strewn with glacial lakes, moraines and boulders of, of erratics. Here, uh, see Justy and photographer Ted Hendrickson, who, who guided us to many of his favourite erratic sites, um, such as the parking lot erratic image that we saw previously in Mystic, Connecticut, and this area known as split rock and canopy rock. We also made a trip with Jen Bourbon to 
to uh, Massachusetts um, to find Babson's boulders on Dogtown Common, um, which Ted had also previously photographed. So pictured here is Roger Babson on, on the left and on the right is a map of Babson's boulders trail that we, we located and followed. So during the Great Depression, Babson uh, commissioned unemployed Finnish stonecutters to carve inspirational words into large glacial erratic boulders strewn across an area now covered by woodland and quite difficult to, to kind of find. So this became you know, a, a wonderful field trip in endeavor to find these, these boulders. So Babson was a businessman notable for predicting the Wall Street crash. And he referred to the commissioning of these inscriptions as writing his final and permanent book. And we found that quite fascinating to think um, of this kind of eccentric businessman back, back in the, the 1920s and 30s, thinking of these boulders as a publication. These are Ted's images. Uh, and they're strangely portent portentous and relevant for cu current economic and global circumstances. This work holds the friction of human and geological bodies and brings into question language languages and publications that bridge between the human and the lithic. So uh, with artist and friend Jen Bourbon, we went there and we made rubbings um, of some of the boulders and we've continued to develop work from this field trip and some of this work by Jen and Nancy and Ted and, and us, a published event was um, exhibited in the listening to in the Anthropocene exhibition, online exhibition, which was curated last year by Charles Sturt University's Creative Practice Circle. And Justy will put the link to that work um, up in the chat box. So it's important to acknowledge that as artists, we've forged very particular direction through the Beinecke's holdings. Um, it was just one transect that we followed. Um, and this specific trajectory compelled us to create this work, the uh, mobile field station in order to activate our findings. And as Ross Gibson says, you know, that the, the archive is this incredibly rich place that we will uh, we all, when we visit it, you know, everything is waiting there for us and we choose to pluck out particular uh, objects and artefacts and events to thread together this story. So I'll pass over to Justy now to continue the story of how, um, how we, we came to construct this field station. Oh, great. Thank you, Marg. Just... I'll stop sharing. Hmm. Oh, hang on. Classic. Okay. Take two. Hello, everybody. Um, Marg, you can just do thumbs up if you can see my screen. Okay. Perfect. Um, Great. Well, yep. As Mag said, it's really lovely to be here and sharing this work and also going back through this work. And um, yeah, it's very meaningful for us. Um, so I wanted to start, I guess, by pick up from um, where Mag's left us in the Beinecke there in um, the depths of the archive and just say, I guess, pretty quickly within the first few days, we realised um, that there was another embodied experience that was going on um, with us both in the library um, and just very, I suppose, cognizant of our bodies in that space. Um, you know, as we touched um, the archival material, the conversations we had, but also this kind of the fortitude and appetite it takes to, um, to gather together and move through um, such a large body of work. Um, I guess we realized um, that, you know, keeping these kind of meticulous records of what we were looking at in terms of archival works um, could also be applied 
I suppose, to the way we were thinking and feeling about our own bodies in that space. Um, and for us, I guess what began as um, probably what began as a range of discomforts in the Beinecke reading room, um, you know, whether it was, uh, which I'll get to in a moment, but, you know, a sense of uh, feeling dizzy or unwell or lightheaded or perhaps with Marg, um, not being able to hear, you know, even talking over these kind of tables in the research room is quite difficult when um, you don't have great hearing. So I'm going to talk mostly um, about the work that we made, the Erratic Ecologies Field Station, but also um, perhaps around the language of embodiment and what else we brought to that archive and what else we left in the archive of the Beinecke, I guess. Um, so here we have Erratic Ecologies Field Station. This is just a detail from the kind of ammo can that um, contains all of this work. Um, we followed this really lovely model in a lot of the books, especially the 19th century kind of field guide and naturalist books that we saw at the library of a very beautiful short title. And then it would say, or um, with a three paragraph title to follow. But essentially um, the work is what we've called an emergent apparatus for speculative research. Um, it comprises of 62 um, copper foiled episodes, which are um, embossed cards, printed cards, two lengths of copper bar and a piece of Stony Creek granite. And we made the works in an edition of three. Um, one is with the Beinecke, one's with a private collection in Connecticut and one's with us. So as I say, composed of these 62 unique cards, you can just see the stack of cards there at the front. Um, two lengths of copper and um, one piece of Stony Creek granite kind of for support. The field station looks simple enough. It also has this blueprint um, which charts the 31 days of, of our activity in the Beinecke. Um, so it looks simple enough, but its ability to give language to the physical, linguistic and kind of philosophical chronicle of experience should not be underestimated. Um, to say that the work was developed from scratch. So we had no idea when we went there that we would create this work, but it's always been a part of our practice to try and publish as we go. And um, in some sense, try and, um, you know, get, gain some traction and force of what's happening in that present moment and try and transport that, that into the public domain, I guess. Um, so I'm just going to look at my notes a little bit and, and refer back. But essentially, you know, as we were moving through this archival work, we also were bringing our bodies into that space. And in 2019, so really a few months before we set off um, on this research trip, um, Margaret and I both sensed changes, I guess, and shifts in how we were feeling, absorbing, reacting and kind of emitting signals in, into the world. Um, Margaret's hearing loss, so that had been quite gradual, but then um, became much more significant, um, led her to, I guess, augment her listening and hearing with hearing aids. Um, and by that point, she probably lost, I think, about 40% of her hearing. Um, and at the same time, I had this kind of increasingly complex cardiac condition and was finding ways, um, I guess, to adapt to um, a life in heart failure. So I guess the erratic ecologies field station became a kind of technique by which we might record in any one of those 31 days at the library, how we feel, but also how we were fielding knowledge and experience and how we were doing that within these kind of uh, disorienting and uh, uncomfortable uh, sensations of our bodies. Okay, so as Mark said, we can, so this is the card. Um, we had printed an edition of 300 of these uh, cards, which were actually not printed. They were embossed in, uh, ooh, embossed foil, foil embossed. Um, so you can see from the, the kind of research we were doing, how the term erratic, you know, from the Latin era to wander or stray has wandered and strayed through fields, uh, you know, diverse fields of knowledge, astronomy, uh, theology, climatology, history, literature, politics, zoology. And I guess what we've put together here 
with the card is we've tried to, um, what's the word, uh, engage and activate and assimilate that language from primarily from glaciology and then these other fields as they came in through the centuries um, with our own experience of bodies in the archive, if you like. Um, so you can see here along the top of the card, you've got um, the field station draws into relation the seven technical characteristics of minerals. So it runs from habit on the left, hardness and heft to luster on the right. Yet within these fields, a, fluid, a fluidity of language enables us to infiltrate, infiltrate these broad geological strokes with movements between the body, glaciology and deep time. Terms such as ablate, quiesce, surge and pluck span both the realm of human and geological organisms. So in our, you know, just, I suppose, in our field work, speculative encounters with books, rocks, fractures, language and people, you know, we're practising, I suppose, this verb to field, the idea of the field work as a kind of in-gathering, um, using the body to bring into language ideas, objects and experiences. Um, as I said, this, you know, the body at that time, we we both had a 40% loss of function, if you like me, a 40% loss of heart function and mug with our hearing. And because of this, I think we became acutely aware of these other episodes that were happening. So um, I guess here we've got in sociality, I'm just looking under tenacity, the idea of um, a glacier plucking and ablating and carving, but also how does it feel um, to have your hearing carving away from the physical body? Um, how is it to, uh, I suppose, in a heart, the circulation delayed and blocked experiences? There are other um, phrases in here brought in, I suppose, specifically from heart failure. So some of the symptoms, um, cough while lying down, swelling of legs, bloating of abdomen, in luster, um, you can imagine a sense of fizziness, dizziness, lightheadedness and fainting. Um, so each day we were moving through the archives in the library, but also um, moving through our own sensations of our own bodies, I guess. So between gravel and boulder, here we have in, in the centre this sphere. Um, on the left-hand side, you see the numbers 1 to 12, which are um, Mo's scale of hardness. Um, and then this sense that perhaps that sphere is the earth or is it the body with the heart at the core, um, the mantle, pebbles. So there was a sense of marking these cards, which we punch through, and you'll see that in a moment, of, of having to assess um, whether you felt like more like a friable uh, fragment on the edge of a relational field or quite a solid core. Um, and as Mark said, you know, this, this sense of being between the physical and the mental, between knowledge and experience really gave us a sense of being both in and out of time um, in the one moment. Uh, just to say here on the right hand side on the heft you see the eighth sphere and I just wanted to to show how this was brought back into um, through the archive so on the left um, the eighth sphere as it appears in Ptolemy's Almagest from AD 150 and again in Albrini's uh, Art of Astrology in 1029 but the idea that there was almost um, a kind of concrete and physical um, fixed space around the universe and beyond that was God or some sense of quietitude or quiescence, something. Um, so I guess when we talk about hardness, heft or specific gravity and, the, you know, geological terms to describe rocks, we are reclaiming those qualities um, to articulate the physical and emotional materials of our condition, of our complex conditions, I guess. Um, and in a way, by bringing those languages together, we're trying to um, 
enable the experience of the erratic as this kind of complex and massive organism of deeply affected matter. This is just, I guess, once we publish this work, taking it back into the field and um, looking back, perhaps at astronomy and the idea of, you know, punching a hole and creating um, an absence in something also is a way of creating an opening for different light to pass through. Um, this is just to show really the, so on the right hand side, there's 62 cards. So every day, um, Marg and I both punched one of the cards. You'll see we've got slightly different um, hole punch size there. And on the left hand side, there's a detail here. So these were, um, these were, where are we? The 13th of October, uh, 2019. That's Mark's card at the top and mine at the bottom. So uh, ostensibly two similar experiences, but um, marked in very different ways here. Um, so for me, I suppose, um, someone with a heart condition um, that is constantly emitting these kind of curious signals, luster is often experienced as dizziness and heft might be experienced as chest discomfort or pressure. Whereas for Marg, prospecting the library um, is, I'm sure, a, a process of attuning to the curious signals of attraction emitted from a particular material or voices or air conditioning unit um, that, may, that might also incite a rapid fluttering or pounding of the heart. Um, I want to say that it's kind of interesting that to note that our collaborative bodies began to fail um, in very different ways at the same time. And when I wrote that, I really thought about the importance of this idea of the same time um, and how critical it is to this work. And I suppose our interest in timelines of keeping time together in this sense of collaboration, in some sense, you have to be um, in time with each other or out of time, I guess, um, but how that really led us into to settle into this idea of the thick present, which is a beautifully named concept um, by Donna Haraway, in which she describes uh, the thick present as a tentacular web of troubling relations that matter now. And I know um, a lot of good work is being done around this area at the moment and especially as the pandemic um, has us all living in these sort of times of partial recuperation where we're drawing back on the past but also the, the future seems um, you know not as fixed and secure as it as it might have once done so just to talk a little bit about the materials um, I was just going to say actually the this idea of um, a shared language and um, this comes back to some of Marg's um, research into Christopher Alexander's pattern language um, that operates between these specialisms um, I think is uh, yeah it's, a, it's another way to to see this use of um, sort of logical frameworks that enable anything to happen within them they're sort of a sense of using frameworks, whether it's um, the form of a book or the form of a printed card or this act of punching or the sculptural form of this work um, in the same way as our Lost Rocks work really enables a solid conceptual framework for us, enables anything to take place within that. It's almost like being able to feel the edges of something enables a lot more freedom. So just to say something about the materials, this is um, Stony Creek Quarry and uh, near New Haven in Connecticut in Guildford. And um, we had a fantastic tour there. And I guess the archives kind of just continue um, in place. So this was um, a special granite quarry. Um, interestingly, it's kind of pink granite. The, one of the only other places of pink granite, as Tasmanians would know, is on the east coast around Colds Bay. So we had a really nice connection there. Um, was also used for parts of um, various monuments and just the stories of how this how this rock went, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles is extraordinary. But 
I guess looking back, you know, we perhaps weren't as cognizant of this, but looking back through the images, you know, we could see, oh, here's someone who's got these uh, samples of the granite. And for us, it became the kind of foundation and strong foundation of this uh, apparatus for viewing. Again, the idea of punching the holes, um, perhaps the idea was already there in these kind of drill explosion holes um, on the right hand side that you see at the quarry. Um, I just wanted to put this one again back in there. So this was um, a work by Mary Rufel from uh, the archives that we accessed. And just the idea of erasing information um, seemed quite important in our process of marking the cards and punching out and erasing information um, from those cards, but also noticing to highlight these very small details. So oh, another, just to, to draw this out again, just we've come to think of this kind of unstable and shifting terrain of the language um, of the erratic um, alongside our bodies, I guess, as a kind of corporeal geology. And that's something imagined by um, Catherine Yousaf and she's written um, a lot on this. And I think Mark's gonna put a link in for that uh, Billion Black Anthropocene. Um, for us, this kind of erratic ecology of matter seems compelled to begin in the corporeal geology of the heart. This is what we might call an apprehending of heart matter. So throughout, throughout history, the heart has been variously defined as conscience and desire, as the innermost part of anything and the vital essential working part of something. It is defined as the stomach, as the mind, the seat of perception, of understanding and albeit, albeit rarely used of memory. So even, you know, for myself, when I think of um, this kind of erratically behaving heart sitting in the, um, the reading room at the Beinecke, even I'm not sure is that heart a stomach? Is it the seat of perception? Does it have a small brain? I mean, all of these things I think are, are really important to um, the way that we're layering experience. So each day we punched our cards and we also made a blueprint of the experience of those 31 days. And we overpunched the card through the blueprint and which created again, something akin to some uh, kind of celestial map. But you can see the kind of things that we chose to extract and note on those days. There's uh, terminology, um, beautiful words that come from glaciology, this idea of glacial milk or the glacial tongue. Um, there were, you know, practical meetings met with Roxanne from Canelli Printing. Um, there were the names of works that we looked at. There were uh, nap times. There were... Uh, words that other artists had used, there were quotations, um, perhaps days like you can see here, the open studio days that we weren't at the library. Um, how did I hear? This is quite a nice image. There are other ways, I suppose, conceptually that we have been thinking about this erratic ecologies field guide as a sculptural work. And one of them is through um, as a kind of biogram, which is a concept of uh, Brian Masumi, which is a, this idea of a kind of lived topological event, something that is manifest in the body of, I guess, a body of matter and time itself. And it's really been helpful for us to turn to philosophy and uh, conceptual thinking, especially in ways of extracting and refining down these works. Because obviously there's a massive amount of information that doesn't go in here, which is, um, and that sort of extraction is just as important as, as what's left out. Um, this was a very nice aspect of the work. In Australia, when you um, have these embossing, foil embossing um, plates, they're plastic and so, we, uh, I think what most likely wouldn't have needed to add the copper for its beautiful conductive qualities had we known that this stunning uh, sculptural artifact would um, 
would have been made in copper and would have been um, discarded at the printers had it not gone into the Beinecke edition. So again, it's just um, a very beautiful, uh, a very beautiful reminder of the kind of force and intensity of some residues of work. You know, when you think an event is uh, has come to the end of its energy and is spent, and yet um, what's left, the residue of that work, is absolutely beautiful. Um, well, I might just finish with another idea from Gregory Siegworth, who, you know, as artists, we're interested in the force of these minute intensities, whether it's the forces of materials like that copper plate or the forces of a heart or of hearing. Oops, there's my alarm. Um, so these forces of um, uncertainty and vulnerability forces that hesitate and forces that can be held and fixed and then lost again and these kind of what Greg Siegworth calls shuttling intensities that he describes as all the minuscule or molecular forces of the unnoticed the ordinary and it's extra and I feel very much in this work that um, out of that huge experience out of all the field work out of the mountains of work that we sifted through in the archive and the way that we managed the sensation of our physical bodies and our collaboration, that this is, um, yeah, very much the idea of shuttling intensities in the present. And I think that's a wrap. Scott, we're ready to come back. Thank you very much. Oh, wow. That was um, fascinating. The um, to get that story behind what is a very striking image in itself of your, your, your field station. Ah, thank you. Um, so I've got a question and you are invited um, audience to please scroll down and hit that little Q&A box and put something in there. But um, if we can start, um, Margaret, and maybe Justin, you might want to, to, to hit this as well. You spoke about how field work allows you to be both in and out of place at the same time. Um, how does that impact your connection to the place? Um, does that awareness bring you closer or further away? Yeah, thanks, Scott. That's a that's an interesting question. And I think by us framing it like that, you know, in this erratic sense of being both in place on the ground, looking around, but also out of place, being newcomers and being observers, really, I think, seem to um, capture when we're in these field work situations um, that you do have this heightened sense of awareness when you're out of place and you see things and you notice things, um, you know, in terms of um, being in Connecticut, you know, you know you're, you're constantly referring and comparing to, to your known environment, i.e. back here in Tasmania, but seeing different plants and different birds, different bird calls, you do have that really I think heightened sense, and it's a really sort of um, privileged sense too of, of being out of place and somehow having to synthesize this as well and make sense of it. And I guess that's where Erica became such a wonderful role model with her work because she constantly and over a sustained period of time is a, an artist who is self-declared out of place living in Ireland and the, and the kind of things that she had attunes to and the fact that she's recorded them as books and in her blog um, you know you get this this wonderful sense of being in place and out of place at the same time that makes sense yeah just anything you wanted to add to that oh that sounded pretty good Mike. um <laughs> I, I was really but you know and it's, it's a great question I was really thinking, um, I was thinking actually about fatigue and um, how when you experience a lot of fatigue, you can often feel, uh, you know, very foggy in the mind and you can feel out of place even when, you know, you're grounded here or you're this sense of being somewhere in that void of the in-between. And um, that's something that, you know, you carry in your body wherever you go. So I was just... Uh, thinking about 
I suppose it just, yeah, it comes down to um, trying to be mindful and present and actually what a kind of constant struggle that can be, actually. So, uh, yeah, think about that. Um, still waiting for a couple more questions to come in, but I've, I've been trying to posit a question around, um, you know, the development of your shared language for this project. Um, what What's sort of the future of that language now where does does that carry on into extra work that you do do you try and share that with others to expand this notion of the erratic is that an offering you're making for people to take on board that kind of language what, what's 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 the approach for the um the shared language yeah i might just start by saying um you know, looking back at this work and how much is there, and a lot of that is, is held as still as research, we had planned uh, in 2020, we were um, invited as artists in residence to go to Massmoka, the Massachusetts, of, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art in North Adams to, um, as artists in residence to continue this work, this erratic ecologies work with some of the colleagues that we met in America. But uh, of course that, you know, the world taking the swerve that it did, um, that's been um, postponed. We were, we put it off until this year, but again, that's not gonna happen. So some of, some of the work I guess has gone on hold, but it is also infiltrated into our, our uh, project, which is kind of developing as we speak uh, called Tender Mutual, um, which is, um, which is another whole presentation. But I think this, this languaging around the erratic is going to continue to, to filter into current and future projects because it seemed to be such a significant um, vocabulary. And it's, I think, really useful for thinking about our current and future scenarios. So this, you know, this, this idea that we that we use those binaries of what's normal and what's not normal and what, um, you know, I guess what the whole pandemic has taught us to think about the new normal. And so these ideas about straying and erring and being uh, somehow in error, uh, you know, we've started to incorporate this into our, our current state. So I think it's always gonna be there. Great. Um, so I've got a question from Alana Hunt. Um, how do you approach the circulation of your work? How do you move your publications? Um, she said she knows you're in Printed Matters Art Book Fair earlier, but curious to know more. Mm -hmm. I could jump in there. Um, well, we've been, we've, I think we've taken qu quite um, a conscious decision at the beginning of a collaborative practice to work outside of institutions. And that might be, uh, you know, galleries or fields of, uh, more commercial literature or visual arts practice. And it just so happens, I think, that we've been able to manage that distribution ourselves. So we've got a great website. We work with a web developer called Public Office in Melbourne. And uh, so all of our Lost Rocks books, so 42 titles, they sell through the website. Through international art book fairs has been really important. But as Alana said, you know, that's a market that has all but disappeared into the virtual kind of online book fairs. And for something like Printed Matter Virtual Art Book Fair, um, that was fantastic because a massive amount of, uh, of energy and resources are, are pumped into that event. And we had a really great experience reaching a lot of um, American and European audiences. It's probably worked less successfully in other online art book fairs, which haven't had that sort of resourcing. Um, but I think over the last six years, and this is, it sort of relates to the last question about language as well, you know, because we're working between disciplines and because we're trying to, I suppose, carve our own space within this emerging, emerging field of publishing as art practice we have to develop our own languages for that. And we have to develop our own networks for distribution. And I think we've done very well in um, creating and maintaining those networks over the last five years in terms of the kind of people who are interested in collecting our work. It's probably true to say that um, things change quite significantly with that trip to America that, um, 
in that we probably finally found uh, people who understood implicitly our work in a way that maybe Australian audiences have struggled to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Look, that probably leaves us close to time to wrap up. So I'd like to thank you, Justin and Margaret, for your presentation. Okay, um, thank thanks to Shavoy and Catherine, um, our Auslan interpreters, and to the RAA team behind the entire Artlands conversation series. So rather than announcing the next Artlands session, I'm going to just tell you about Artlands, which is coming up September 1 to 3. You can attend either through the main hub in Launceston or the state hubs in Toowoomba, Alice Springs, Caratha and Lobethel, or you can grab a digital pass and watch three days of amazing art and conversation in the comfort of your own home. So the digital present uh, passes are available from our website. Um, we will be continuing Artlands conversation with a second series um, post Artlands as well. So thank you all for joining um, today. Um, it's great that there were so many people on for this and we look forward to seeing you at Artlands. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thanks.